Cameraman, are you ready? Let's do this. I have about 130 slides and I'm gonna go through them all. Catch, keep up. Are you, ready? are you ready to keep up? 130 slides on cross-site scripting? Let's do this. So by the way, my name is Jim Manico. I'm gonna be your presenter today. I'm a former global board member of the OWASP Nonprofit Foundation. I wrote a book on security, web security for the Java ecosystem. You know, the language that, that all the .NET languages were based off of and made a lot better. Thank you, .NET, for fixing Java. I also work on several open source projects, the Cheat Sheet Series, Java and HTML Sanitizer for XSS Defense, and the OWASP Application Security Verification Standard. I work with large teams of volunteers around the world to promote application security. I'm gonna show you some attacks. Don't hack without legal permission. Penalties include loss of job, jail time, and po yeah, possible imprisonment. What, what's your name, sir? What's your name? Andre, how you doing? Jail was horrible, wasn't it? You, he, he, he's like, no jail, trust me, the food is terrible, the wine is bad, small rooms, you don't want jail. Also, free and open source software I'm gonna talk about in this presentation. Please use a proper vetting process and keep your third-party libraries up to date. Buckle on to, buckle up. We're going to move fast. You're late. You're late to my talk. You're late to my talk. I was late to get started, so we're even. It's okay. I was a little late getting started. It's okay. okay. We're going to learn how to test your apps for cross-site scripting. We're going to learn how to defend against XSS with output encoding, input validation, HTML sanitization. We're going to learn about JavaScript safe functions and unsafe functions and apply content security policy to our pages. And a little bit of bonus, we'll talk about the new technology trusted types, which is a way to configure how JavaScript runs in a browser. We have a lot to get through. This is my level one defense grid. If you're going to display data exactly as a user typed it in, output encoding. If you're going to let a user author HTML, you need an HTML sanitizer to render that safely. You have to use safe JavaScript APIs and be ready to sandbox third-party content that is going to be insecure. So what is XSS? XSS is a misnomer. It's a wrong name. It's nothing cross-site about this per se. A better name is content injection, or if you want, JavaScript injection. It's the most common web vulnerability. It's easy to exploit. And by using scanners, I can find XSS easily. Now, any individual XSS problem, it's straightforward to fix, but it's difficult to fix at scale. That's why it's so hard. Think of all the software in your company. How many user interface templates do you have? How many variables do you add to a user interface across an organization? millions of variables, and every one of those needs the right defense. That's why this is so hard. There's many ways to fix XSS, and we need to surgically know the right way. Watch this presentation. I'm going to show you. So the impact to your business is significant. This is basic XSS. I have a URL with a parameter that's rendered in the user interface called a reflective feature. How do I abuse this? Well, I just, I just changed the comment to some script. I, I somehow send it to a victim. They click on it. And because that comment parameter lands in the UI, I can now trick a user into rendering my script. That's really bad. This is called reflect. How can an attacker misuse this? We're going to look at that in a second. But re with reflected XSS, I send a link to a user. They click on it. It activates evil JavaScript, and I can steal data from the browser. Great bearded one. I am honored to see you again, good sir. Everyone honor his beard. Bow to the great beard. I, I, I'm working on it, sir. I'm a little goatee-ish. But anyway, so let's, let's get back to it. We could steal data with cross-site scripting pretty easily. One more thing, stored XSS. This is implanting some kind of content in your database, like a message system, or like I'll edit my profile, change my description, and save it to your database. Then somebody else looks at my profile description, and my JavaScript as the attacker lands in the victim's browser, and I can steal data. So how do we test for cross-site scripting, right? How do we test? First of all, what are our testing goals? Can an attacker 
get their own content into your website so special characters render raw in a web page. Less than, greater than, and similar. Can an attacker get their own JavaScript, HTML, or style, or other markup to execute in a web page? Not your code developers, but a co code from the attacker who's injecting this into your software. Now, when I'm testing for XSS, I submit JavaScript through your normal form parameters, to your API, through a cookie, whatever data you're reading, and I'll put JavaScript in there. I'll then check web pages that render that content, and this is my typical test, script alert script. This is not dangerous, but if I can get this to execute, what did I just do? I proved that I can get JavaScript that's evil to run in your website, and I've proven that you have an XSS vulnerability in your application. So far, so good. Now let's car so, so carry on. So first of all, we it's really hard to filter XSS or JavaScript attacks on input. There are thousands of ways that I can bypass your filters by encoding and 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 confusing my and uh, manipulating my attacks in a variety of different ways. So I don't think that filtering XSS is the right answer. We have to build user interfaces with security built in to do this correctly. No question about it. And by the way, please use caution when using these real world attack payloads. I've had not one, not two, but three students go to jail as a professional instructor based on these next 10 slides. So I'm not even joking. I've had students use these real world attacks against websites without legal permission, without hiding their tracks using a, you know, a anonymizing service and they got caught and did jail time. So take this seriously. This is cookie theft. Remember, where does the attack launch? In my browser as the attacker? No, I'm the attacker. I submit this attack to your website. This is submitted some, to one of your features, and it then lands in the user interface of the victim. So I submit the attack, and then someone else reads that web page and lands on this code, the victim's browser. I build a URL for, to my website with the cookie of the victim in it. I then load an image on the DOM. It's invisible. When I do image.source, it goes and does a get request to load the image and it sends your cookie to my server. What if I steal your cookie? What does, that, what does that mean? What can I do if I steal a cookie? I can compromise your account by hijacking your session. I like you, you got the right answer. So that's good. So I can use this to steal his session. Now I can always flag, well go back. I can always flag a cookie as HTTP only. This is a cookie setting that stops me from reading the cookie. How good is this defense? It's crap. Now you should still do it, but all it does is stop that one line of code and returns an empty string. It doesn't stop the script from fully running. So we should use HTTP only, but don't depend on it. Because if I want to attack you, I'll just do something like this. I can deface the website. I can do any weird code I want. And once I get to document body inner HTML, I deface the whole body virtual site defacement. There you go, let's move on. I can steal everything from local storage. I just walk through every local storage item and go image.source to send a get request to steal every local storage item out of your website. I can also fetch a login page and walk through the entire login page and replace any action with evil.com. So it will be an exact copy of your login page. And when you hit submit, it's gonna send your credentials to my collection server and then log you back in. So you look like you logged in, but I got your password in a redirect. Or how about this? This is a keystroke logger. I send a socket to my website into this function. And every time you do a keystroke, I get a copy of it. What else can I do? There's a polyglot. This is a, an attack that's a JavaScript URL, and no matter where I submit this attack, it's gonna execute a potential payload. This is a, a, a testing URL. Here's a better one. This URL right here, it's gonna bypass a lot of firewalls. 
and no matter where this lands on a page, it's going to execute on mouse over and on load. It's called, again, a polyglot XSS attack. If you're a security tester, take a picture of this. This is a great little security test to have in your back pocket. You just submit this to every single form field, every cookie, every data entry point, and see if it renders anywhere and executes that alert. This is how we test for XSS. And the thing is, you may have firewalls trying to block me, but I can represent JavaScript in a lot of weird ways. This is XSS with no letters. This is XSS with no letters or numbers. Um, and so there's just a lot of ways I can obfuscate JavaScript. Here's a weaponized payload set of attacks specific to WordPress and Drupal. So I can attack administrators on some of the most common content platforms in the world. And so here is also a, a, a professional payload from a real high-end attacker who has several thousand XSS payloads to use in security testing. Do you believe me that cross-site scripting is a serious issue that you need to fix as a developer? Are you with me on this? Let's talk the real reason we're here. The, one more before we do defense. Here we have, here's a real world problem with XSS. This is Apple telling us that Apple AirTags have stored XSS. Now this is a lie. Apple is, def Apple is trying to shift the conversation here because AirTags are not that important to the enterprise. And the problem was the attack goes in the AirTag and then the AirTag sends the attack to the found.apple.com page that rendered AirTag data raw. So it really was Apple's, what part of Apple's software is found.apple.com a part of? That's their login system. So the reality is Apple's login system had a cross-site scripting vulnerability. That's not good. That is not cool. One of the biggest companies in the world, their main login page for their entire identity system had cross-site scripting in it. And they were like, Oh shit, I don't want the world to know about this. So they blamed the air tags, which received the input. But that input was sent to Apple's login page, which rendered it raw. You don't render data raw anywhere on the web, let alone the login page of the biggest company in the world. And Apple's got the marketing to shift the conversation. I called a couple media to talk about this. I was like, this is a lie. What's going on? You know what the tech media told me? Hey, man, let me level with you. Apple's our biggest investor and biggest, biggest advertiser. There's no way I'm writing the story. Hey, man, Apple gives us $10 million in, in like ad revenue a year. I'm not running the story. Apple? No, no, call someone else. That's what I got from the tech press. They don't want to hear about it. Let's move on. Why do we come here? Not to hear about attacks. Yes, yes, Mr. Great Beard at one. Yeah. You don't, the only side to protect is the user interface. You do not, and I'll talk about this in just a moment, but you, you can't really, you can't reliably build a filter that blocks JavaScript when it comes to rich content. Because I can have a legal URL with XSS. I can have a legal email address with XSS. So legal input is often vulnerable. So we don't solve this problem on input. We solve this problem on output where we're adding data to a web page. That's the only way to solve this problem reliably in any software system. Sir. That, that is, well, it's not, well, it's not which side has the problem. The side that has the problem is the user interface because that's where you take the content and render it. So the problem is always in the UI. That's where the injection happens. It may enter your system from different points of input, from a cookie, from an API, from a request parameter, from a header, but that data gets to a UI, that UI renders, and that's where the problem happens. So my philosophy here is, I'll talk about in a second, you build reliable user interfaces that, that know how to render content safely, and it doesn't matter what the input is, we're gonna be okay. And this is, a, this is not just my opinion, this is pretty conventional wisdom in application security 
around how to really, as a developer doing, doing, writing code, how to build secure, secure software. Is that a fair, fair, at least from my perspective, is that a fair answer, sir? Or? Pardon? Pardon? Yeah, I, I, I swear to you sincerely, I don't see this as naive. I, I've been a professional developer for 25 years. I've approached this problem from a dozen different angles. I've been a professional professor for about 10 years, and I focus my study on this. So I think it's the opposite of naive. I think it's sophisticated. We'll see if you agree in a few minutes. So all of these different strategies, remove a script tag, eliminate special characters, trying to detect and block evil JavaScript without blocking good data, all these are bad strategies. Because this is almost impossible, first of all. The entire web application firewall industry, a multi-billion dollar industry, tries to do this and fails. Because if I tighten the blocking rules too much, I'm going to block complex, good content like JSON. And if I make the rules even a little bit too lax, I got XSS. There's no middle ground here. You're not going to pull this off, at least up to today's technology. So. What does that leave me with? It le these strategies just don't work overall. We spent 20 years trying to make them work. So this is my principle. Ensure all protection from XSS is done at the UI layer. That's where the rubber hits the road. That's where your variable is put in danger. Just like where a variable enters a SQL query. I don't stop SQL injection on input. I stop SQL injection with the parameterized query. So this is about injection resistance. The best place to stop injection is where the dangerous variable hits the parser. In a SQL statement, it's when you parameterize a query. With XSS, it's when you're building a UI. So when I start adding variables to a UI, I assume every variable is dangerous, and I protect every variable I add to a UI template. No variable gets a free raw ride. That's why Apple had XSS. They made that mistake. And I never depend on server-side protections like validation to protect me from XSS. I build user interfaces that are 100% robust to XSS defense strategy. Let's do this. So here's my defense grid. If I want to display data exactly like the user typed it in, I'm going to do output encoding. If I'm going to let a user author HTML in a WYSIWYG editor, for example, I'm going to use an HTML sanitizer, and I'm also going to learn which functions in JavaScript are safe and which are not. We'll sprinkle in some framework tips as well. In every major language, there's an encoding library. This allows you to convert input from a dangerous form. Why is this character dangerous? Why is the less than symbol a super dangerous character to add to a web page. What do you think? Why is this character thoroughly dangerous to add to a web page as user content? It starts a tag. So does the browser think of this as display data or code? Code. How do I add this variable to a web page so it's just display data? I use an encoding function that encodes this as an HTML entity. This is the less than symbol HTML entity. And if I just take your, your input, maybe your physical address, and I encode like six characters into their encoded form, it will now display on the screen without executing. That's the heart of XSS defense. This is built into Svelte, React. View, uh, Angular, every other major JavaScript template, Java server pages, active server pages, and almost in Python templates, they take variables and escape them pr pretty much by default. This is a common defense across the entire application stack industry. And so these are the main characters that I want to escape or encode. These are the characters that let me build dangerous chunks of JavaScript. And if I convert them from code to display data, for all input I add to a web page, it's not going to pop anymore. It's not going to execute. It's going to render the data and display the attack, but by doing this, I neutralize it. And I can't do this on input properly. 
I don't know how to encode until I know where the variable is added to a web page. Because what makes this difficult is, I, I, what makes this difficult is I need to, disp I need to encode the data differently based on where I add it to a web page. So I don't know how to encode it on input. Am I doing HTML entity encoding, attribute encoding, CSS hex encoding, JavaScript hex encoding, URL encoding? I don't know. And I don't know until I add it to the user interface in some way. This is my world, Java server pages. It's an old technology, but this is the vulnerability. I'm adding a variable to all these different locations in a web page without any encoding. Every example here is cross-site scripting. We're gonna come back to this later and fix it. So what we do is we encode. We either use a, a framework that does it for us, or we use these encoding functions, encode for HTML, encode for attribute, encode for JavaScript, encode for CSS, encode for URL. Let's look at, and we have the same thing in .NET and every other major language, like the Microsoft encoder library. And so what does this mean? This means if I'm going to add data to the body of HTML like this, then I need to properly encode it like that, encode for HTML. In fact, if you're using React and you got your mustaches, it will do it for you. If you got Angular, got your double mustaches, it does it for you. The same in Vue, the same in Svelte, since that's usually what we're developing on. If you're still managing older technologies, you need to do some of the encoding yourself. And again, when I'm in, here's the attack. Here is the dangerous attack that's going to steal cookies from your browser. And if I encode it in the user interface, this is what I get. This will display the attack, but will not execute it. It effectively neutralizes the attack. We have the same kind of issue in the world of attributes, like right there. Here I have untrusted data, a data that the attacker can edit and send to your system, and it lands right here, either a width or some kind of preset value that was driven by user data, and I'm going to fix this by encoding. I make sure my attributes are double quoted. I encode for HTML attributes. When I'm building URLs like this in a web page, it's a little tricky. I have this variable that I'm adding to the middle of an anchor tag href attribute. So I do this all the time, or how about this rest? The black code is hard coded, only the variable is untrusted. Now, how do you encode this properly? This is where it gets a little tricky. It's double context. So I first build the URL safely with URL encoding, and then I have this URL, I make sure it's a quoted attribute and I encode for attribute. So I'm double encoding here because that variable is in two locations. It's a little bit tricky. This is exactly how Go templates do their automatic escaping, one of the best in the industry. What else do we got? Yeah, Go templates. So look at this right here. They're saying if I have an anchor tag with an href attribute, and I'm, I have a query parameter, you can see some HTML escaping or encoding as well as some URL encoding because they're double encoding as they should. You encode for URL, so the URL is of a pro it, so the URL is a proper standard. It's a legal URL. And then I don't trust the URL, so I attribute encode it before I add it to an attribute, and I'm good to go. No pun intended. See, do you get that? Do you get that joke? I'm good to go. Right? Sorry. It's, really, it's pretty bad. Pretty bad. I know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. What do we got here? So here, okay. Let's bypass Vue and React. The, both of these JavaScript framework technologies, they, uh, what do they do? They use JSX, the template language. And so here's how I bypass it. Suppose we have a social media feature. And I ask you, give me your homepage, a common feature. You enter in your homepage. I make sure it's a valid URL. Then I'll put your homepage in an anchor tag. Visit user's Facebook page or whatever. And I just send a URL that looks like this. Is this a legal URL? Yes, it is. Try it in the browser with the page open. It will execute. JavaScript, document, body, enter HTML, and I defaced your website virtually. That's how, and I just bypassed JSX by default in React and Vue. Angular will not accept this. Angular will detect and block it, but all the other frameworks will let this ride. 
okay, this is why we really should have frameworks that solve this problem, but they don't. So in React, I'll do this. Same thing with Vue. I'll say, here's a secure link class. I'm going to render an anchor tag, and I'm only going to render the href attribute if it's safe. And all that safe is saying, it must be a legal URL. It must be either HTTP or HTTPS. Otherwise, I'm not going to render it. So a JavaScript URL or a data URL is going to be rejected. This is a weakness in React that should not be there. And it's, it's, at least it's easy to deal with. Problem with JSX. What else do we got here? Let's take a look at this. If you're doing inline JavaScript, here I am adding a variable in the middle of a script block. Well, I can do all kinds of attacks against that, right? Like I can do double quote semicolon and do a defacement. And this is what that new line of code would look like with this attack, var, name, empty string, new statement, then deface. So brutal. How do we deal with this? With an encoder, I, I do this even to this day, some less so, but some, I just encode for JavaScript and I make sure they're quoted variables as well. Now, let, let, me, let me jump ahead here a bit. A few final thoughts on basic encoding is that there are just certain places in a web page you can't safely add data. Like you can't put data in an eval function. You're basically telling the user, please let me know and I'll execute any JavaScript you want. Not good. Or I, I can't put data in a tag block. It needs to be in a quoted attribute to provide safety. Also be careful of Angular bypass security functions. They turn off the security of Angular. Look out for dangerously set inner HTML in React. What's your name, sir? Andres, if you're using the React function dangerously set inner HTML, what kind of life are you living? You're living? Yes! Thank, high five. So don't live dangerously as a developer. Go buy a motorcycle and go drive fast, but don't use that function or use it safely. I'll be right back. Remember the first page earlier in the day? Let's secure it. Boom. By encoding these variables properly, no matter what attack gets to the database, no matter what attack gets to user interface, any possible attack is neutralized because we're doing proper encoding on that page. So I can get the input validation wrong. I can get the, the web firewall wrong. I can have a corrupt database. As long as I'm doing proper encoding, it's impossible to get evil script to run in that page. That takes us to here. Remember, what I'm saying here is, if you want to display data exactly like the user typed it in, then rely on encoding. But what happens if you want to do HTML rendering of a user? I use this a lot. Like I use either, either tiny MCE. This is a WYSIWYG editor. Well, go back. What you, go back. I either use tiny MCE. This is a WYSI. Okay, I'm sorry, I got, I got animation problems. It's okay, we'll, we'll, we'll just we'll go with it. Sorry, sorry. Animation trouble. So there we go. What this is is, work with me. It's a WYSIWYG editor. This is a text area in HTML. I applied the tiny MCE library and now I have a rich text editor. Different font sizes, links, uh, tables. When I hit submit on this content, it submits a chunk of HTML. I could ease, and we want that HTML to render. What if I escape the HTML in an encoding function? What happens? It will display the code on screen safely, but it's not gonna render like the real intention. So how, and the other replacement that Tiny MCE is Froala. This is a way better WYSIWYG editor. But my question, and look, every major framework has tried to build an HTML cleaner and has failed at some level. Here is the HTML sanitizer of Node. I can bypass an early version with this. Here is a bypass to, to WordPress with a JavaScript link. Here's, and, and here is how we solve the problem in Java or .NET. 
we use the Java HTML sanitizer or the .NET fork by Mr. Gantz, who maintains a fork of this project. This lets me set up a programmatic policy around what HTML I'm going to accept, and I just say sanitize, and any tag I don't accept gets ripped out. I don't like doing this on the server side, though. It doesn't fit into modern frameworks very well. What I'd rather do is do HTML sanitizing in the browser itself. So remember living dangerously? Now I can say dompurify.sanitize by the Cure53 DOM Purify library, and I can basically take any dangerous chunk of HTML, sanitize it, and what's left is safe to render anywhere on a web page. And so this is a really popular library. It's so popular that Google and the ECMAScript standard body has agreed to integrate the DOM purify.sanitize function into the core of JavaScript. It's so important. And here we have, what's this? This is React. How are you living? Dangerously. But I, if I'm going to use dangerously set inner HTML, I'm turning off React security. And if I apply DOM purify.sanitize, problem solved. It will clean up the HTML before it renders. This is also available inside of, uh, inside of Angular, but this is native. You just say ng bind HTML, it's part of Angular, and it runs an HTML sanitizer to clean up any bad content. The same thing in Vue. This is how I'm, in, I'm integrating Vue into, in, integrating DOM purify into Vue. And again, React is the most popular framework. Anytime you use dangerously set inner HTML, make sure you sanitize the content. So what, where does that leave us? If you want, let me go back to here. If you want to display data exactly like the user entered it, then you should be encoding. If you want user data to render HTML safely, then use an HTML sanitizer, preferably one that's built into your user interface, not server side stuff. And so let's go deeper and look at JavaScript functions. Every single one of these JavaScript functions is dangerous. Hey, camera guy, how you doing? Are you having a good time? How much time do I, speaking of time, how much time do I have left? I'm sorry? 50? Five, zero? Awesome. No, that's not true, is it? How, mu how much time, 15? Show me how much time I have left with hands. He said 50 minutes, and we don't have 50 minutes, do we? How much time do we have, please? I'm alone here. I'm going to get some water. Do you ever see the show Rick and Morty? Remember when the Time Lord went and beat up Einstein? What are they? Don't mess with time. Don't mess with time. I will mess with time. Oh, sorry, sorry. Best episode ever. Hmm? Seven minutes? Oh, 27 minutes. Oh, we're good. How you having a good time? I need a little break. I need a little break. It's a little break time. Oh. All right. Do you see why all of these JavaScript functions are dangerous? Why is inner HTML so dangerous? Why? I just did 100 slides in 15 minutes. That's bad. So why is inner HTML such a dangerous function? Anybody? What if I, get, what if I have JavaScript in a variable and I send it to inner HTML? What will happen? Yeah, so that's the problem. If I know that a user variable that I submit to your API ends up in the user interface in inner HTML, I can sneak JavaScript into that input and it will execute when you get to inner HTML. These are all JavaScript syncs that affect the user interface that will execute JavaScript if it gets to that variable. It makes most of the JavaScript language pretty dangerous. And these are safe. All of these are safe. Text content, insert adjacent text. Even if I have evil JavaScript in that variable, it is not going to execute. I also have form field dot value. 
This is not going to execute script. It's commonly used in JavaScript. Create text node, create element. These are ways to program it, programmatically add something to the DOM. They're going to be safe as well. And I can make all the other functions in the world safe by using DOM Purify. Inner HTML is going to populate HTML raw, but if I sanitize the content, it's suddenly safe. This is really important to the future of the web. And again, it's going to be native in ECMAScript in the next version. So what else? How about jQuery? jQuery is an insecure, antiquated piece of filth as a library that nobody should use. Don't use it. We should be moving to React or Svelte or Vue. Or if you don't like yourself and like to maintain code in a painful way, then Angular. Sorry, Angular. Sorry, sorry. That's just real. Anybody here maintain a lot of Angular code? How are you feeling today, sir? Everybody, everybody stop. Everyone, ra raise your hands for a second. What's your name, sir? What's that? Cold beer. Okay, everyone, everyone do me a favor. Just give him a little shake, give a little shake. He's maintaining Angular. No, get a point at him, point it at him. Ready? Go, go, give a little woo. Come on, help me out. So we're sorry you're suffering. All of us here feel your pain of having to maintain Angular code. Do you know your boss's phone number by any chance? I'll call him right now. No, can we call your boss? I'll do this. Okay. What is your what is, what, what is your what is your boss's number? Can you type it in for me really quick? I don't I don't have a lot of time, but come here, come. Go ahead, type it in. You don't have. Oh. By the way, but do you think I would actually call your boss in the middle of the talk? Yeah, yes, I would. Is this for the record? I would totally do that. Let me, let me see if I can get Philip on the phone for a second. P H I L I P P. Philip, let's see if he's here. Come on, Philip, answer. Come on, buddy. Philip is one of the one of the best Angular instructors in the world, and he likes Angular. I don't know why. Hey, Philip, are you there? Hey, Philip? He's here, he's there. Hey, hey, uh, uh, Dr. Derrick, are you there? Yes, I'm here. I'm in the middle of a talk right now, and I have you on speakerphone. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. I'm what, one of my students is maintaining Angular code, and he says he hates himself, and he does nothing but suffer, and he wants out of the suffering. So he, he, he really hates Angular. Even though, and I know that you love Angular. I, I'm trying to understand why. What should I say to this developer who maintains Angular for a living and hates himself? That's my question, Professor. Angular is by default. So it's uh, supposed to make your life easier instead of harder. Okay, I'll, I'll tell him that. I'll, I'm going to stop torturing you. I'll let you go. Thank you, doctor. Okay, so Dr. Derrick just said, hey, Angular is largely secure by default. So even though you're experiencing a lot of pain and suffering, you're helping the world be more secure. And he's right. I give Angular a hard time. I do think it's hard to maintain. I do think it's a pain to deal with. But look at all the frameworks out there. Who has automatic HTML sanitization built into it? Not React, not, not Vue, not Svelte, not native JavaScript. Only one framework on the planet has this built in, and that's Angular. So while I feel your pain, we must listen to Dr. Derrick, who says, really, it is by far the most secure framework on the planet. So your suffering is our security, and we thank you for your sacrifice. All right, that didn't come out as funny as I wanted it to, but I want to get back to work. I'm just going to burn some time, so we, I'm, I'm a little bit ahead. So these, this is how we do jQuery safely. I've had several projects where one of my friends in India, who's a developer, I go to India to teach a couple times a year. He's like, Jim, we, we've been using jQuery, and we have like a million XSS vulnerabilities. And I'm like, help. I'm like, all right. So I look at his code base. And I see that they're doing a, just a couple, lot of these lines here. Really neat code, but we have this stuff in here. A lot of use of HTML and append. And I look at how they're doing it. It's just HTML. So I'm like, I can secure this whole system in like a day. I need like two interns, 
and I need your mom to send me her curry as a frozen package to my house, and I'll do it for free. And he's like, mother, talking in Hindi. And the mother's like, is that Jim? Hello, Jim, you like my curry? You're a smart man. My son will do it, right, son? He's like, yeah, yeah, mom. Okay, so I got the deal. A frozen package of really good curry and two interns to work for me for a few days. We went through a million lines of jQuery crap and imported Dom Purify and sanitized in about 400,000 locations every use of the HTML rendering engines. And we were live within a week. We had a few things broken. We fixed it up. And in a matter of a week, we were able to, fin we were able to fix several million lines of, of, of jQuery advanced code by using Dom Purify. Did I get my curry? Yes, I did. It showed up in a DHL, a German courier, in a multiple layer dry ice package where the few inner layers were still frozen, the outer ones were not, and frozen block of curry from like this gourmet chef. Oh, oh my God. I remember eating it and my girlfriend's like, are you gonna share any of this with me? I'm like, I'm like okay, let's, let, 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 let's just move on, let's just move on. So. So do we have a good idea of our strategy now? Let's think through this. All jokes aside, let's think through this. If you're going to display data just like the user typed it in, you need to use an encoding function. Angular's uh, mustache, React's double mustache, or whatever the basic encoding function is for that framework, number one. Number two, if you're going to use URLs in an attribute, you got to validate that URL to make sure it's not a JavaScript or data URL. You make sure it's a legal HTM, HTTPS URL, preferably. If you're gonna let a user author their own HTML that you wanna render safely, then you need to use a formal HTML sanitizer. I only recommend one, Dom Purify by the Cure 53 team. They're working with the standard body to integrate their technique into ECMAScript. Also, if you're doing low-level JavaScript programming, you need to understand which JavaScript functions are dangerous and which ones are not. If the function is dangerous, DOM purify, or just use the safe functions. This is our basic uh, design and architecture guide to doing XSS defense properly. Now, here's a few other things. Suppose you need to deploy content from a third party and you have no trust over that content. Well, you can then use an iframe sandbox. This is pretty robust, but it locks things down too much sometimes. If I have an iframe with content from a third party, I can set up a sandbox attribute and that will stop scripts from running. So if I'm given like an advertisement and I want to neutralize the JavaScript in it, I'll just drop it in an iframe sandbox. Or if marketing gives me a tracking widget that has no security in it, I'll just put it in iframe sandbox until they complain. I, I, I got in a big fight with marketing at one of my customers. They were like, um, please put this marketing widget on the homepage. And I'm like, it's HTTP. It's from a fly by night company. I'm looking at the JavaScript with tracking vulnerabilities. I'm not gonna do this. And they are like, we are your boss. We are the marketing team. We know what we're doing. I'm like, no problem. So I put their tracking widget in an iframe sandbox. And I said, no script is allowed. And they're like, and I showed, here, here, there it is. And they're like, great, thanks. Six months later, they were like, yeah, we're not getting data from that tracking widget. And I'm like, oh, maybe, the, maybe it's broken. They're like, no, no, go look at your code. So all I did was I turned on allow scripts. And now the, the tracking script would run, but only in the sandbox, and it wouldn't affect the rest of the page. They were getting very little data, but they went away for another year and the app was protected. All right, that's not a great story, but. All right, content security policy. Hey, camera guy. 16 minutes. Thank you, sir. Let's talk about content security policy. I'm gonna use slides with permission from Lucas Weichelbaum and Michelle Spagnolo. These are both uh, uh, senior security engineers for one of the largest software companies in the world. I know we all have opinions about Google in Europe, right? Yeah, like let's sue them for billions of euros for stealing and violating the privacy of all EU citizens. GDPR, okay, okay, can we get that out of the way? Now the individuals that work for Google are some extraordinary professionals who really care about web security. So 
Is that Mago? Hey. He's leaving. All right, bye. So these gentlemen, they, they didn't write the standard. They're not managers. They're not developers. They're research scientists, and they're experts in content security policy. They went to about 1,000 different Google websites, and they applied content security policy and studied the effectiveness of their defense from a scientific study point of view. And what they tell us is, this is the only good way to deploy CSP, is with nonces. So what is content security policy? Content security policy is a response header. And this header, it, the name of the, and you can, what is a response header? Anytime you deliver a page to a browser, you have the response object. And you go add header, name, value. So it's a trivial thing, it's metadata that I can add to any response, to any web page. So I'll say in this, re in this response, I'll say content security policy to activate the standard. And I'll say script source. When it comes to JavaScript, only run it if it includes that nonce. Now that nonce should not be R4ND0M. It should be an actual random value different with every page load. And so I got that random value. And now if the attacker injects this script, it's not gonna run. If the attacker injects this script, it's not gonna run. Only that script from the developer with the proper nonce is gonna run. Only that script with the proper nonce is gonna run. So this is a way for me to set a policy to specifically nonce the script blocks that I care about. So if the attacker injects into the page, he don't got the nonce, so it's, their attack is not gonna run. This is by far one of the most effective ways to stop XSS in any modern browser. Even Safari picks this up as a 15.4. So, 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 what's wrong with this? How many dependencies could this file have? This one JavaScript could have 100 dependencies. And in this case, they're not gonna run. I have to take the nonce and apply it to every single library I need. And when you have complicated hierarchies, that's almost impossible to do. So in the world of content security policy three, we have strict dynamic. Strict dynamic in a script source block will, will allow JavaScript execution via document create elements. So what that means is if your library is adding dependencies programmatically, this is what you should do. This is the only proper way to add a dependency to a library. In fact, let me show it to you this way. Here I am with the script nonce block. They're building a string that's a script block as a dependency and then writing that to the document. This is not the right way to use JavaScript. This is wrong. Same thing here. I have a nonce, I have a script block that's building a script block that's a string and adding it to the body. That's the wrong way to do JavaScript. That is not proper JavaScript programming. It hasn't been for over a decade. You want to do this, programmatic DOM JavaScript use. This is proper JavaScript. Create element script, there's my source, add it to the body. And if you add your dependencies to your libraries this way, when strict dynamic sees a nonce right there, it will automatically load that dependency if it's added programmatically. Now I can do a crazy positive policy. A nonce, strict dynamic, I just need to nonce the libraries I'm using, the dependencies load automatically, and I block any plugin or base jumping attack. I'll look at that in a second. So what does that mean? This is the way to pull off content security policy. Script source, nonce, strict dynamic. If you need to use the eval function, unsafe eval. Object source will stop object tag injection. Base URI will stop base jumping. I'm gonna pass on those for now. Now, even better, if you don't need the eval function, then just do this. You got a nonce and you got strict dynamic and now you, and then you nonce each. Are you taking a picture of this, sir? Wait, 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 wait. let me get in on this. Come on, come on. Let's do it one more time. Got it. Thank you. So this is like not strict dynamic. This means any library not, it will load the dependencies. Even better, don't use strict dynamic. Have a much more discreet 
and limited list of JavaScript libraries and not every library and every dependency with the nots, and then you don't need strict dynamic. This is by far the best way to roll. It's much more difficult to deploy because you need to know every single dependency in your JavaScript family. That's content security policy in a nutshell. I recommend go Google these two Googlers. And these gentlemen are, have several presentations on how to deploy content security policy. This is by far the best in the world that I've seen. And I'm using their slides with permission. I appreciate being allowed to use it. Let's finish up this presentation. This is the, now we're almost done. The latest technology to try to stop cross-site scripting is something called trusted types. This is really impressive. When I enable content security policy, require trusted types for script, all of a sudden these dangerous functions, inner HTML, outer HTML, they all stop working. Any function in JavaScript that will execute script is disabled when you enable require trusted types for. The way that we solve this and the way that we use it is like this. I can, for, there's content security policy, require trusted types for script, and now, inner HTML, if I, if, if when I do create HTML, it's going to automatically run the sanitizer. And if I run inner HTML by itself, it's going to reject it. It's not going to run because it's not properly configured, right? So up here, I say the constant sanitizer, anyway, if type of trusted types is undefined, sanitizer is tr create policy foo. And create HTML says DOM purify sanitize the input for any HTML create function. So if I go sanitizer create HTML, then I got a safe use of inner HTML. And if I use inner HTML by itself, it's not going to run anymore because trusted type says you may not do that. This is a it's a really advanced standard. It lets me programmatically define how individual dangerous functions in JavaScript work. And I do believe this is the end of the line for XSS defense. And my hope is, a hope I've had for many, many years, and I've tr been trying hard. I want one thing out of life. I want to give the last XSS defense talk and have this problem be resolved. I've been giving this talk for many years. And I'm hoping this is the last time. I am hoping that trusted types is the final defense layer and that we can put this problem to bed and move on to other problems. I am done with the talk. We talked about how to test for cross-site scripting. We looked at output encoding, input validation for URLs, HTML sanitization, what is safe in JavaScript in some of our frameworks, and last, we looked at Content Security Policy 3.0 and the new Trusted Types Initiative, giving you a complete discourse on what XSS defense is today and what the state of the art is today. If you have questions for me, hit me up on Twitter, please. Twitter.com slash Manico. And most importantly, thank you all for being here and caring about security. And I salute you all. Go forth and write secure code. Go forth and write secure user interfaces. If you have questions, let me know. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you for coming to my talk. Have a great day, everybody. Cheers. How, how, how much time do we have left? How, how much time do we have left, by the way? Any, I'll do Q&A. Any questions about XSS or about you know, security in general? Hey, GB, great bearded one. There's my argument. What do you think? Thank you. That's my take on it, yes, sir. I, I can get a lot of defense on input, don't get me wrong. Like if I can say in a validation layer, letters and numbers only, that stops XSS. Or if I say this may only be a number, that stops XSS. It's really the like the big paragraphs of text, open text, HTML, URLs, email addresses, all of those are impossible to validate. Thank you for coming here, sir. I appreciate, I appreciate your, your, your comments and being here.
Any questions? Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. Uh. Well, what do you cache? First of all, if the page is, if the page is static, you don't need XSS Defense. If the page is dynamic and you're adding variables to a page, that can't be static. Now, the template might be static and the JSON is dynamic, right? So you, got, so you have a static template like React that loads JSON dynamically. So in that case, you build JSON securely. But the question is about content security policy and nonces, right? So what I would recommend is I wouldn't, if, if, if generating random numbers at scale is becoming a bottleneck, then you can make the page bigger but static by using hashes, by using CSP hashes. Let me show you this real quick, sir. And this is something that will cache better, but it increases the page size significantly. That's, I tend to not use it. So, but it's, it's definitely an option. Where's my mouse? There we go. So let me go to CSP hashes. So he wants something that doesn't require a lot of random number generation. So I can have a script here that I like, and I'll generate the SHA-256 hash of that script. And then I'll say script source and content security policy, SHA, and that hash. And I have a list of them. Okay, I'm sorry. I was really excited. There we go. I'm almost out of here. So I have a script that's legal. I generate the hash of it. And in CSP, I say script source, SHA-256, and a hash value. I have a unique hash value for every script block I need to accept. And that way, it's static. I don't need to do a random number anymore. But I'm going to have a list of hashes for every single script block, and that could get big fast. So there's your answer. You want something more cacheable? Content security policy, script source hashing is your solution. Thank you, sir. I'm done. Hey, thank you again. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Have a great night, everybody.